Okay, hi everyone. This is lecture one, introduction in homeostasis. This is the first lecture of bio six. This is going to be the introduction to physiology. We're going to talk a little bit about um, what is the study of physiology, compare it a bit to the study of anatomy, which is a prerequisite for this course. We're going to talk about levels of organization in the human body, from chemical all the way up to the organism, which is the human body, um, and then homeostasis. And we'll talk about the process of homeostasis and introduce the basic terms of homeostasis that we will be using throughout the semester. Okay, so first, what is physiology? Physiology is the study of the functions of living things. In other words, this is the how of what the human body does to function. So how does the human body work? The anatomy is more the structure and the what. The physiology is the how. Physiology really focuses on the mechanisms of action. That is the cause and the effect of sequences of physical and chemical processes, processes in the body. So in other words, what comes first? What causes what? Um, we're gonna talk about this on a very molecular level. We'll talk about it um, molecule by molecule, system by system, um, such that you guys will really in great detail understand what is behind each of these basic body processes. Okay, so here's an example. Um, the, the physiological process, um, we're gonna ask what, why, and how. So uh, first we can say what. Um, you know, one example is shivering in response to cold. So everybody knows that, um, you know, when you're, when you're outside in the cold, if you start to feel cold, um, your, your muscles are going to start to shiver um, uncontrollably. This is not something that you are able to change. This is a, a regulated process in the body. Um, why does this happen? This happens because shivering generates body heat. So there was some place in your body that was able to sense that you were too cold. Um, in, in, in this system specifically, we're talking about the hypothalamus, a region of the brain that is responsible for thermo or temperature regulation. Now that's not just enough to say the what and the why. What we're going to do in this class is really get into the how. How does this actually happen? What are the tiny details that uh, you go really going to drive you crazy with itty bitty tiny details of how this actually happens? So we'll go through step by step. First, there's temperature sensitive nerve cells or neurons that detect a decrease in body temperature. Those temperature sensitive neurons are in the skin. So those are peripheral thermal receptors or temperature receptors in your skin. They're gonna signal a region of the brain, which is the hypothalamus, that is responsible for temperature sensitivity. That's going to activate a neuron or a nerve pathway that causes involuntary waves of muscle contractions. Those are the motor neurons or the neurons that contact skeletal muscle. Now normally those are voluntary. Those are the neurons responsible when we decide to make a movement. Um, but we can also override those with the hypothalamus and cause them to shiver. Um, that shivering is then going to increase the activity of those muscles, which will lead to an increase in metabolic heat production. Okay. That's shivering, which increases body temperature in response to an initial decrease that was felt outside the body. Okay, uh, so really what I want you guys to get used to is using the how to explain the what. We spent a lot of time in anatomy on the structures of the body. And so you know already that they are closely related to the functions of the body. For example, over 300 million tiny air sacs, do you remember what those air sacs are called? Alveoli. Over 300 million tiny air sacs in the lungs contain these very thin 
walls. Does anybody remember that specific tissue from anatomy? Simple squamous epithelium. That is the thinnest possible epithelium. That's um, the thin walls of these tiny air sacs or the alveoli. And those are very thin for diffusion of gases because the gases from inside the air sacs of the lungs need to get to the blood vessels or the pulmonary arteries and veins that are surrounding the alveoli. They need to diffuse that air from these tiny air sacs into the blood that is surrounding them. So both actually the capillaries surrounding them and the alveoli have very, very thin simple squamous epithelium so that the gases can very easily diffuse across a very thin barrier. So those blood vessels are for diffusion of gases between the lungs and the blood. One example of how beautifully the structure of the body or the thin layers of tissue closely relate to the function of the body or the need for gas exchange or diffusion across those thin layers. Okay. So your textbook has this great example and I love it. So during the minute that it will take you to read this page, just scroll through some of these. Your cells will consume 250 milliliters, about a cup of oxygen, and produce 200 milliliters of carbon dioxide. More than one liter of blood will flow through your kidneys, which will act on the blood to conserve wanted materials and eliminate unwanted materials in the urine. Your kidneys will produce one milliliter, about a thimble, thimbleful of urine, in the next minute. It's going to take you to read this page. So a lot going on, even when you're just sitting here, passively allowing your body to function. So we're going to talk now about levels of organization in the human body. We're going to talk about six different levels, from the most microscopic, that is chemical, to the body as a whole, that is the organism or the human body. So first, chemical level, then cellular level, then tissue, organ, organ system, and organism. And you guys will get used to my way of organizing slides. Whenever I have a list like this, I will always go through one by one and explain them on their own individual slide. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go from chemical, the tiniest of molecules, all the way up to the body system and the organism. Okay, so first chemical. Chemical level is the atoms and the molecules that make up the body tissues. I'm looking for my pen here. There we go, so that we can do some things. Let me just turn this on for you guys. Um, I have a little sheet here. We'll be able to take notes as we go along. Okay, so we're going to start with the chemical level. So chemical first, we're talking about atoms and molecules that make up the body. Atoms are the smallest building blocks of matter. For example, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Atoms combine together to make larger molecules. For example, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, lipids, and nucleic acids. Both atoms and molecules are the chemical level that makes up the body. Chemicals and molecules will come together as the building blocks of cells. So the next level is cellular. And cells are the basic unit of life. So you need to have a cell to be living. We're going to have a whole lecture on that. And cells are the smallest unit capable of carrying out the basic processes associated with life. They're enclosed by a plasma membrane that is made up of special molecules we call phospholipids. We'll, we'll get into those in a bit. And their interior compartment or composition is regulated. They're going to contain the atoms and the molecules that are used to produce and maintain for life functions. That is the cellular level. So for example, a cell in the stomach. There are some basic cellular functions 
that need to happen in order to maintain life. One is obtaining food and oxygen. The second is performing basic chemical reactions. The third is eliminating waste, for example, carbon dioxide. The fourth is synthesizing and making proteins. The fifth, controlling exchange of materials in and out. We need to make sure that we know what is coming into the cells and what is coming out. We'll talk about how cells control the exchange of materials in our cellular lecture. They need to be able to move materials. That's part of controlling the exchange and also eliminating waste. It's also part of obtaining food and oxygen and chemical reactions. We need to move materials throughout the compartments. We need to be able to sense and respond to the environment. So cells are going to have receptors that will respond to various things that they are able to sense in their environment or in the solutions around them. Cells also reproduce, and that is through the process of mitosis and meiosis, and we will spend some time in a couple of lectures talking about mitosis as well. Cells are specialized. So in humans and other multicellular organisms, cells perform specialized functions over and above their basic functions. So the basic functions that I just gave you, for example, protein synthesis, controlling exchange, moving materials, they're going to have a slight variation on that based on what type of cell you're talking about. So for example, in the digestive system, we'll have in some organs digestive glands that will use protein synthesis machinery within the cells that's already there for basic cellular functions. They're going to expand on it and use their machinery to produce digestive enzymes. These are specialized proteins that will be there to break down food. These will only be found in certain digestive organs, but they use the same process, protein synthesis, to make those specialized proteins. So the basic function is protein synthesis, and the specialization there is to make digestive enzymes. Another example is in the kidneys, where kidney tubules tightly regulate substances between the blood on one side of the cell and the urine on the other side of the cell. So the basic function here that they're taking advantage of is controlling exchange. And the kidneys do this to an extreme and very, very selectively to retain necessary substances in the blood, for example, fluids, electrolytes, nutrients. All of that needs to stay in the blood. And then to be able to remove waste, um, toxins, urea, um, excess um, acids, um, etc. So the basic function there is controlling exchange. The specialization there is to selectively exchange needed substances between the blood and remove waste from the blood. Okay, another example, muscle cells. Muscle cells are able to move materials just like general cells, but they have specialized proteins that are very um, dense inside the muscle cells, so dense that when you look inside a muscle, um, you can see the striations or the stripes that are created by these proteins. And these are proteins that produce intracellular movement that generate tension and contract muscles. So they move materials just like other proteins and other cells, but they do it to an extreme to where their proteins move so much and they have so much of this protein tightly packed within them that they actually produce movement of the entire cell. So there are specializations of cells in addition to their basic functions. Okay. So from the chemical, then we can go to cellular and then tissue level. So we will bring multiple cells together to make tissues. Tissues are groups of cells with specialized functions, some examples of which we just talked about. And cells of similar structure and function will combine to four main types of tissues. Hopefully you guys remember these from anatomy. So the first is epithelial, which will be the lining tissues. The second is connective, which will be the structural supportive tissues. The fourth will be muscle tissue, which is tissue that moves. And the fourth will be nervous tissue. That is tissue that is able to electrically and chemically communicate. 
So epithelial connective muscle and nervous. An example there are the layers of the tissue in the stomach wall, where you will see epithelial, connective, muscle, and not shown here, but also throughout the stomach, you would also have nervous tissue. So remember that epithelial tissue is internal and external coverings. They form barriers and boundaries, and they are specialized for exchange of materials in and out of cells. So epithelial tissues you will see in the lumen of hollow organs, lining that lumen um, to exchange materials in and out of cells. Connective tissues connect, support, and anchor body tissues, many different types specialized for attaching and also transporting materials. So you may remember that blood is actually technically a connective tissue. Then the third is muscle. And that's going to be movement and contraction of organs in the body. The example I gave you in the cellular specialization is skeletal muscle, where we're tightly packed with actin and myosin to move the body. But also we'll have certain types of muscle tissue, smooth muscle in the organs, and they will be specialized for movement of cells and cellular components. Okay, the last is nervous tissue, and nervous tissue can initiate and transmit electrical signals. We'll get into the details then when we get to our nervous tissue, nervous system lectures, and they are really specialized for sensation and response to external and internal environmental cues. From tissues, we're going to go to organs. Any given organ is going to be made up of several tissue types. So the example I gave you previously was a digestive organ. So for example, the stomach. It's lined with epithelial tissue that's going to produce secretions and digestive enzymes. You guys should remember from anatomy your gastric juices. They will absorb nutrients and protect against stomach contents as well. That would be the mucus portion of the secretion. Um, digestive enzymes will be in the gastric juices. Um, anyway, epithelial tissue is producing secretions and protecting the stomach. Then the middle wall of the stomach will have three layers of involuntary smooth muscle tissue that will contract to mix, churn, and break down food. Finally, nervous tissue throughout its layers will respond to the food entering the stomach to prepare the stomach for food entry. Okay, finally, finally, <laughs> we'll have connective tissue throughout to bind the organ together as it moves and stretches during digestion. So that's an example of the organ level of organization. Okay, so where are we? We've had examples of four different types of tissues, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. We put those together, there's your epithelial, there's your connective, and there's your muscle. Muscle will have the nervous throughout. That is going to be all of the tissue types that make up a single organ like the stomach. Okay, now organ systems. So chemical, cellular, tissue, organs, organ systems. So we'll put several organs together and they will be organized as they interact for specific body functions. So for example, the circulatory system is made up of blood, heart, and blood vessels, but we'll continue with our digestive example where we can put together the stomach, the large intestine, the small intestine, accessory organs like the liver, um, all together to make up the digestive system. And there are 11 total body systems. The circulatory or cardiovascular system, the digestive system, the respiratory system, the urinary system, skeletal system, muscular system, integumentary system or skin, immune system, nervous system, endocrine system or the hormonal system, and the reproductive system.
Here are the examples from your textbook of the functions of each of these systems, and hopefully this is review for those of you that have taken anatomy. So the circulatory system is going to be heart, blood, and blood vessels. Digestive system, all of the organs of the digestive tract and accessory organs like salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, and the gall. Respiratory system, all the organs of the respiratory, respiratory tract from the nasal cavity all the way to the lungs. The urinary system, mainly their kidneys and then the outflow of urine through the ure ureters, urinary bladder, and release that. The skeletal system is the bones, the cartilage and the joints that go along with the bones. And the muscular system, skeletal muscles. Integumentary system, primarily skin, but also accessory organs, hair, and nails. Immune system also includes lymphatic and lymphoid-associated tissue. So, for example, lymph nodes, thymus, bone marrow, tonsils, um, where you'll see collections of white blood cells and related tissues. Nervous system, brain, spinal cord, and the nerves, and special sensory organs to and from the brain and spinal cord. The endocrine system, all of the hormone secreting tissues, many there, including hypothalamus, pituitary, and many of the other glands. And finally, the reproductive system, where the focus there will be on the gonads for male, the testes, for female, the ovaries, and then all of the accessory organs for the movement of the gametes through the reproductive. So we put all of those body systems together and we get the whole organism where the body systems are going to work together to regulate the body as a whole. And I want you guys to keep this in mind that even though we're going to function in this or focus in this class on the organ systems, organ systems really function together. They're the complete organism. So we'll talk, for example, about how the kidneys work together with the cardiovascular system, which works together with the endocrine system, all to maintain homeostasis in the body. So the human body is made up of living cells, which are organized into life-sustaining systems. And again, the goal for these is to maintain homeostasis. So homeostasis is the ability to maintain stable internal conditions despite changes in the internal or external environments. We're going to draw a little bit more over here. Okay. So homeostasis is a very key concept in physiology. So let's make some notes on homeostasis. Homeostasis really, the bottom line of homeostasis is balance. We're maintaining balance in the body despite external changes or conditions. So this is going to be done from the cellular level all the way up to body systems in order to achieve what we call steady state. So steady state is basically the goal. Steady state is a small range of internal conditions balanced within the body as a whole. So for example, if we look at internal conditions like temperature, fluid or the amount of blood, nutrient levels, chemical composition within and around various cells. Each one of those will have a particular steady state. So for example, can anybody tell me body temperature? Yep, 37 degrees. Okay. So that is going to be the goal temperature of the body. So the body is constantly working through homeostasis to maintain steady state. And that is a small range of internal conditions that need to stay balanced. So steady state is really 
a set goal of a variable. For example, temperature where 37 degrees is the goal temperature for the body. And homeostasis is really dynamic. There's a constant process of continued fine-tuning and adjustments to maintain the internal conditions of the body in response to any external changes. So we can go to very cold levels, very cold areas, like we can go to the North Pole, or we can get in a hot tub. And our body is going to continue this dynamic process of fine-tuning to maintain 37 degrees body temperature. But homeostasis is not just body temperature, it's many other factors as well. Overall, then, homeostasis is essential for the survival of individual cells. Individual cells then make up body systems. The body systems will continue to work together to maintain homeostasis and the cycle continues. We need homeostasis for cells to survive. The cells within the body system are going to sense conditions so that we can constantly maintain our steady state. So to think about this, I really want you guys to think about that the cells have fluid and materials surrounding them just like our body is in a particular environment. So there is an external environment that is the surrounding environment in which an organism lives. So for example, the temperature of the environment or the temperature of the air, the amount of food that's available, um, all of this is the external environment, the surrounding environment in which an organism lives. Not every cell has contact with the external environment. So those cells have to rely on exchange and regulation within the internal environment. So our skin has contact with the outside, but the majority of the rest of our body is more internal than that and has to rely on sensation and exchange and information from other areas of the body. So those outer areas of the body will then have to signal internally and then we will have to change the internal environment around the internal cells in order to maintain homeostasis. So there's also the internal environment, which is the fluid and material surrounding the cells within the body. We call this extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid surrounding a cell. Interstitial means between the cells. Then we'll talk about the cellular composition or the fluid and materials inside the cell. And that is then the final place that is going to keep the cell alive. So we have, what does the outside look like? What's the temperature outside? And we have, what is the fluid surrounding the cells? So for example, what is the temperature of the blood? And then we'll have the fluid actually inside the cell. For example, what is the temperature actually maintained inside the cell and how do we do that? Okay, so I want you guys to think about this from all these different levels. Think about what's inside the cell, Think about what's surrounding the cell, and then think about the, the greater environment, which is not in this picture, the greater environment, um, which will be affecting the body and the cells as a whole. So for homeostasis, when we talk about steady states, I want you guys to think about um, these factors that will be regulated. So we've given the example of temperature. And I often have students on the exam when I ask about homeostasis um, and they say homeostasis is the regulation of body temperature. No, homeostasis is the regulation of many factors, but body temperature is just the easiest example for you to think about. So homeostasis is not the regulation of body temperature. Homeostasis is the regulation of many factors within the body to maintain balance in the body. So some of these factors that I want you guys to memorize, so take note of these. Nutrients, for example, glucose. Gases, for example, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Waste products, 
for example, urea and other nitrogenous or ammonia-based waste. pH, that's the level of the acid and base in the body. Water, salt, and electrolytes. I'm going to lump those together. Volume and pressure in the body. So for example, the volume of blood and blood pressure. And then finally, not to be forgotten, but please don't think that homeostasis is only this, temperature. So seven factors, really, that you guys will see throughout this course that will be regulated in order to overall maintain balance in the body. There are also homeostatic control systems. So homeostatic control systems are interconnected networks of body systems. These are body systems that are working together to maintain a given factor in the internal environment. The factors being what I just showed you guys, nutrients, gases, waste, pH, etc. So fully interconnected network operating to maintain a certain factor like nutrients or pH in the internal environment. What needs to happen in order to get homeostatic control. First, you have to be able to detect deviations from normal. You need to have some kind of sensors to detect where you are with relation to a specific factor and with relation to a specific steady state. What, how far are we away from 37 degrees? We then need to integrate this information with other information in the body. Do we want to be at 37 degrees? Do we need to be a little warmer? Are we fighting an infection, for example? Then make appropriate adjustments in the body systems, organs, and cells to return this factor to normal if it has deviated. So these are the components of a control system. First, there's the variable, nutrients, pH temperature, etc. that's needed by the body. Then we need a sensor to detect a change in that variable or factor. Then we need to actually get that sensor information into the body and integrate it with other information in the body. So the integrator, typically the brain or um, some kind of endocrine or hormonal center is going to receive sensory information and bring it together with other information like the state of the body. Do we care about this in this particular situation? What other information can we put it together with and decide how to respond? Then that response will go to an effector, which will be a cell, a tissue, or an organ that will actually make the change. That change that is actually made then is the response, a change in a factor that is produced by the target cell, tissue, or organ. All right, let's draw this out. This is your textbook picture. I want to draw this out for you guys too. So for homeostatic control, First, we have a variable. That variable is some kind of factor that we are interested in. Let's say, okay, we'll go with temperature. What is the temperature of the blood? That temperature is going to be sensed or felt by a receptor. In the case of temperature, receptors are in the skin. That information from the receptor will then be sent to the area of the brain that cares about temperature. And that is considered the integrator. So the integrator then will take that information from the receptor, let's say, Temperature is 36 degrees. The receptor is going to sense that 36 degrees, and the integrator is going to say, hmm, that is too low. 
Why? Because we have a steady state temperature of 37 degrees. The integrator decides that's too low. It's going to send signals out to an effector, namely skeletal muscle. And it's going to tell the effector to produce a response. We already talked about this. What's the response? The response is shivering. So we started with a variable, temperature. We sent that variable with a receptor. We sent that information from the receptor to the integrator, which was an area of the brain in this example. The integrator then put that together with information overall in the body to say temperature is too low. We need to make a change. We'll send a signal to the effector, namely the skeletal muscle, to make a response, and that is to shiver. Hopefully, that response will counteract, in other words, increase temperature, so we can maintain balance at a steady state of 37 degrees. Here's your book's example. You have some deviation in a controlled variable that's detected by a sensor. That will inform or send information to the integrator. The integrator will put that together with the rest of the body information, <coughs> send instructions to effectors. The effector will then actually make a change, which hopefully is a compensation or a compensatory response that will result in returning the variable back to normal or steady state. There are a couple of ways to do that. We can do this locally, which will be an intrinsic or local control, and that is within a single organ. For example, a single muscle that is really active uses up a lot of oxygen, reducing oxygen levels nearby. Nearby blood vessels will sense this chemical change and dilate to bring in more blood and oxygen to that single muscle. Next will be extrinsic control. Multiple body systems will coordinate regulation of several organs toward a common goal, and that was the example I just gave you. But here's another one. Low blood pressure is sensed by receptors through the body. The nervous system will send signals then to the heart, kidneys, and blood vessels. That's both cardiovascular and urinary systems to increase blood pressure back to the mean. The last bit of this is looking at um, the types of responses that are made. The example that I gave you and the most common is negative feedback. That is um, a counteracting type change. Another example is positive feedback. Positive feedback um, is something that doesn't counteract but actually amplifies a change. There are also feed forward responses that are responses made in anticipation of a change, so they happen before a stimulus has occurred. For example, secreting saliva in anticipation of a meal. So feed forward is really kind of a learned response that will happen before a stimulus is is, is before we were able to respond to a stimulus. Let's say that again. Feedback is a response to a stimulus after a change has been detected. Feed forward is made usually due to some kind of learned response in anticipation of a change based on other cues. So negative feedback is the most common. So negative feedback is a change in a factor that triggers a response in the opposite direction. That is a stabilizing or a corrective change. That should oppose change. 
it will increase relative to steady state. If an increase relative to steady state is detected, then negative feedback response should be to decrease. If a decrease relative to steady state is detected, then negative feedback should be to increase. So let's draw this out again. Just like we saw for the temperature example, negative feedback goes like this. What do you sense? If you sense that something is too low, then your response should be to increase. Because these are opposite signs, for example, too low was too negative, and you decide to increase or go to positive, and you call this negative feedback because they're counteracting each other. You could do the flip side of that, and if you sense that it was too high, then your response should be to decrease. So in other words, if it was too high or too positive, then your response should be in the negative direction or to decrease. They're always in the opposite direction. And we say that that counteracts the stimulus. So whatever you sense, you respond in the opposite direction, and that's classic negative feedback. The example here is the heating and air system in your home. So you have a certain room temperature, that's going to be your factor, it's going to be a temperature. You have a certain steady state, 75 degrees, so unless you're my husband and then it's like 69 degrees, he wants it to be super cold, or me, I want it to be like 80 degrees. <laughs> so the set point is going to be your desired setting in your house. The sensor will detect the room temperature. The thermostat will be the integrator, and it's going to turn the furnace on and off to keep your temperature within, oh, let's say your 75 degree set point. The effector then is the furnace. The furnace will produce heat when the room is too cold or turn off the heat when the room is too hot. So we'll go back to our negative feedback. The sensation for the first one was that it was too cold. The furnace then increased heat. So it sensed a decrease and its response was to increase. That's negative feedback. In the flip side, if it's too hot, if it senses too much or an increase, then its response will be to decrease activity or to turn off. In either case, that's a counteracting or opposite response. So that's classic negative feedback. Take a moment to review the example from your textbook, which is the same example we just talked about. We could do the same thing for body temperature, which we have already done. So for example, if your body temperature is too cold, you have temperature monitoring cells in your skin, they will send signals to the brain that says it's too cold. The brain will send signals to the effector, which is the skeletal muscles, which will increase heat in response to the decrease. That increase in heat should increase body temperature back to counteract the initial set point. So again, we have some deviation in a controlled variable that's detected by a sensor, which informs the integrator, sending instructions to the effector, bringing about compensation in the controlled variable. Positive feedback is a more rare example, but there are a few examples in the body. Positive feedback is where you have a change in a particular factor that will trigger a continued response in the same direction. In other words, it will amplify or create a domino effect. So it's waiting for some kind of signal. When it senses that signal, it continues to increase that initial change. 
So in positive feedback, we increase relative to a set point. The positive feedback response then will be to increase more. The decrease relative is positive feedback will continue to decrease further. The, an easy example of this is childbirth. So in, in this case, there are contractions of the uterus that are there to push the baby out. The set point then will be maximum pressure for removal of baby from the uterus. So the body wants to get the baby out. It's time for the baby to come out. The sensor will detect uterine pressure increases and cervical stretching. The integrator will be the nervous system sensing uterine contractions and will send signals to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland will re release a hormone called oxytocin, which will continue to increase uterine contractions. If you've ever heard of pitocin given to women during childbirth to increase contractions, that's the synthetic form of oxytocin. In other words, we sense an increase in stretching and contracting. We send signals to stretch and contract and push and contract and stretch more and push and contract and stretch more. And this will continue as a domino effect, which is very destabilizing and amplifying. And it will only end when the stimulus ends. And that is when the baby is no longer pushing on the uterus. So when the baby drops low in the uterus, that initiates labor by cervical stretching. That will stimulate oxytocin release. Oxytocin will cause uterine contractions, which will push the baby more against the cervix, causing more stretch, causing more oxytocin release, causing more contractions until the baby comes out. And that stops this domino effect or the amplification cycle. Okay, so one last bit on homeostasis, and that is the range at which homeostasis functions. So for homeostasis, we're talking about maintaining internal conditions despite external changes. So this is really balance. It's dynamic. And for homeostasis, we're going to have a set. Point. When you look at these factors, so nutrient levels, pH, acid base, you're not always exactly on the set point. You're usually within some kind of a range of that set point. So you have your ideal, which is your set point, and then you have your actual, which is some fluctuation around that set point. So you're going to have a range. How far you are from the set point will determine basically the health of your body cells. So you've got your set point. There is an optimal range above or below that set point. So here's our set point. There's a certain range that your cells will function most optimally and will be healthy. There is also a hard line, minimum, and maximum. That is what we call the range of tolerance. At which you can tolerate below the maximum or above that minimum, but beyond that maximum and minimum, the cells are really going to start to be unhealthy, illness, disease, death of cells can occur. So we have a set point. And we have the normal fluctuations that will happen with the dynamics of homeostasis within some optimal range. If homeostasis is not functioning properly, we may deviate further from that optimal range, but if we get too far below or above, that's where we get into disease. 
and we'll talk about examples of that throughout this semester. So the optimal range is where the body and the cells can still function most efficiently. The range of tolerance, body and cells can still function, but it is not optimal. And if we get past the range of tolerance, above that max or below that minimum, really is when illness, disease, and death can occur. So when everything is working, when compensation succeeds, the body is healthy, cells are doing well. When things are not working, when homeostasis is not functioning properly, that is when illness or disease can occur. Okay, thank you guys for listening. Um, please take some time to review and take notes, and let me know if you have any questions.